Welcome everyone. Um, if you're part of the family or if you're a guest here this morning and you arrived after the welcome, I'll give you another welcome. Um, you'll be happy I'm um, sharing this morning. I wasn't given a theme. That's dangerous. <laughs> you'll be happy to know that I'm not going to be talking about sex, alcohol and drugs today. Don't worry about that. Some of you are like, whew. I'll leave that to Ivan in a couple of weeks. Don't worry. Um, this week has been very significant to us as a family. Uh, it's my wife and I. Uh, we had our fourth anniversary as a couple. Uh, yeah, it's great. Great to be able to spend time with her. Unfortunately, I was in Liverpool with Ivan. So that didn't go down so well. Um, and this week, Noah went to nursery for the first time. So a big, big week for us. Um, Becky and I took him on, on Monday. And it's a nursery not far, it's here in Tlantley, not far from us. So, you know, those of you that are parents, those of, those of you that are to become parents, you know, that, that's a big thing, isn't it? Trusting a vulnerable child that doesn't yet speak to people you don't fully know. Trusting uh, one of the most valuable gifts that God has given us to, to somebody else. So that was big for us. But I, I want to show you what happened. Uh, do we have the audio as well? <laughs> no, I couldn't wait to get in. Becky and I were very emotional. I'm like, oh my gosh. Like, I, I, I told people at work that I was going to be late because I wanted to be there for the first day. I'm going to drop my child at nursery. I thought, my gosh, he's not going to want to go. And then what are we going to do? We're going to have to take him back home. And that's going to be a big deal. And there he was, the only child that was knocking on the door of the nursery and said, let me in. Let me in. When they finally opened the door and then he went in, Ran, hung his coat, was in the playroom, sat down, grabbed a, um, a little car and some crayons, and he was drawing. <laughs> Becky and I were sobbing in the corner. <laughs> o- honestly, that's not a joke. We were sobbing and crying like, oh, little baby, he is there. He was loving him, loving him. Big, big things happening to us this week. But praise God, because God is good. We received a a word from Carol this morning about Eliana, the God who hears. God hears you and I. And we need to know that. We don't don't serve a God who is like an elf in the shelf watching you. If you're going to do anything wrong and he's then going to tell somebody else, tell your parents. No, God loves you. God hears your prayers. God is not a mean God who is just waiting for you to mess up, for me to mess up and then to punish us. No, this is not the God we serve. We serve a good God that loves us. He's got good things for his children. He wants to walk with us. We're going to celebrate and meditate on that God this morning. So let's get stuck in in what we're here for. Last week we had an excellent speaker. We had Ruth Swift from Australia, and she spoke with us on momentum. Momentum, when God is either doing something or about to do something. God spoke with us in that. And then over the past couple of weeks, and especially this last week, I've been praying and asking, God, what should we do as a church this morning when we gather together to hear the word? What should we meditate on? And I felt strongly in my heart that we need to build on what we shared last week, on that momentum. As I said, when there is momentum, God is either doing something or he's about to do something. And I, I want to get ready for it. When God is doing something, I want to be ready for that. If God is about to do something, I want to get ready because I want in. I want to be part of what God is doing in Tlatli. I want to be part of what God is doing in Wales. And I want to be part of what God is doing in the nations. I want to be ready for that. How many of us believe that God is doing something in the world today? I mean, the world is upside down. 
whether you like politicians or not, whether you agree with what they're doing or not, the world is upside down, but God is in control. You know, God is not freaking out and saying, oh my gosh, they're going to leave. Is it going to be a deal or no deal? God is not freaking out with his hands in his head and saying, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? No, God is not doing that. Do you know what God is saying? I've got a deal. And that is the best deal that was nailed on the cross for you and me. And it's called Jesus. And it's not about the money. He has given it all for us, for you and I. God is not freaking out about what's going to happen. He knows. And he is in control of that, of myself, of your life and my life. He is. He is saying, I've done it because I love you. I want to get ready for this momentum. I want to be equipped for it, just like these guys were. When I think about momentum and equipping, I think of one guy, and this is the guy that we're going to share about this morning, I think, of a young man called Joshua. And I'm, I'm going to invite Will. Will's going to come and he's going to do our reading this morning. Thanks, Will. I told him I need a true Welshman. I did tell him I was going to read in Welsh, but he said that's not good enough. <laughs> I don't know what my grandmother would have thought of that. Uh, it was a bit of a panic, really, when uh, Lucas asked me because I, I didn't have a Bible on me. I didn't have the written word, but I have got my uh, beloved. Uh, the, the Bible is in my little, uh, my Gideon Bible, I should add, uh, is in my uh, smartphone. So we went into that room on the right there, and I picked the Bible up, and, uh, and I started reading it, and... Uh, then I, I looked in the front, and it belonged to Roland. Oh, and you know Roland is a very special friend, of, was a very, very special friend of mine, and I felt very emotional that I'm privileged to be standing here. And so you can pretend this is Roland reading the word, not me, okay? Because he had a posher accent than me, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't so well shielded. Uh, it's uh, Deuteronomy 31, verse 1 to 9. Then Moses went out and spoke to these, these words to all Israel. I am 120 years old. Now, I don't know why Lucas told me to read that. <laughs> but, but I want you to know that I'm 40 years younger than, jo that, than, uh, uh, than this man, okay? Than Moses, you know, so there I got 40, oh, I didn't say I've got 40 years in front of me. But, but then the second part says then, I'm 100 years and 20 years old. I'm 120 years old, and I am no longer able to lead you. Well, okay, he was 120. The Lord and the Lord said to me, "You shall not cross the Jordan. The Lord your God Himself will cross over ahead of you. He will destroy these nations before you, and will make possession. Will take possessions of their land. Joshua also will cross over ahead of you, as the Lord said." And the Lord will do to them what he did in Sihon and Og, the king of Amorites, whom he destroyed along with their land. The Lord will deliver them to you, and you must do to them all that I have commanded you. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of, because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you, he will never leave you nor forsake you. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the presence of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you must go with the people into the land that the Lord swore to their forefathers to give them, and you must divide it among them as their inheritance. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Amen. Thank you, Will. God bless. Yeah, I was going to pray for us. God, thank you for these moments that we share. Thank you that you are here with us, Lord. We want your word to speak into our hearts. We want to meditate and find gold, find truth in your word and apply that to our lives, Lord. Be with us today as we do that. 
gathered as your church in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I know some of you know the story of Joshua, but I want to I give you just a brief intro um, in case you don't. Uh, Joshua is a great young man. He is uh, in the Old Testament, and uh, he's a Jew. Um, his people are slaves in a foreign land. They are in the Middle East. Can you imagine a whole nation, all slaves? They are in another nation because they didn't have a land, so they are there. And in that, God hears that his people are suffering. And God chooses a man, not Joshua, but another man that comes before him called Moses. And long story short, God takes the people out of that land. So they leave Egypt in the Middle East. And they're going to walk towards the land that God has promised them. A promised land. But in that process, there is a desert. Those of you that have um, been to the desert or have lived in the desert, you know it's not pleasant. Kerry went to the Sahara a few years ago. Loved it, didn't you, Kerry? Fantastic. Just like green whales. No, it's not. It's tricky. Oh, God took people over the desert into a promised land. But in that process, uh, there was a transition. And in that process, there was a man. There was a new man called Joshua. Here's a great story. In the desert, um, the people that saw what God did, the wonders that he did, and how he took the people away from slavery into freedom, the ones that saw that, they were dying in the desert. God was making something new. And it was a new generation. And then we have this guy, a normal guy called Joshua, that God raises uh, to see something, something new. The leaders from the past died. The people that saw God move in a mighty way, they died as well. There was something new. There's a new story with a new generation. God was about to do something when Moses was about to stand down as a leader and Joshua was standing up as a new leader. God was about to do something. There was momentum there. This is the, the story in a nutshell. You can read more in the first five books uh, of the Bible. In this story, we have God. We have the people. We have Moses, we have Joshua, we have the desert, and we have a good land. Now that's all good, but you might be asking, where are my three, where are my three points? I'm, le I'm learning that. that You've got, you, you got to make three points. So let's look into it. God was about to move, and something big was coming. The older generation, the ones that had experienced, they were decreasing in numbers. And the younger generation had not seen what God had done. And they were raising in numbers. And I believe that there was something there for us this morning. The first thing I want us to talk about and to understand is this question. Where is your Moses? What do I mean by that? We tend to think that this guy called Moses, he was leading the people until it was his time and God took him away. He died. And then God would then raise Joshua and say, okay, Moses, you're gone. Joshua, you come in. But actually, when we look into the story, the two generations were working together. Moses was a man that saw amazing things. He went into a tent and he spoke with God. God would come down in a tent. He would speak with Moses face to face. Do you know where Joshua was? Right outside that tent, walking with Moses. Towards the end of Moses' life, they were leading the people together. Moses was hearing from God. He was sharing with Joshua. He was inviting Joshua into that environment. And they, they, the two of them would come out together and they would address the people. So what do I mean by that? Where is your Moses? In our lives, where are the people that we are walking with and learning from? It wasn't just this new generation comes out of the blue and knows nothing about the older generation. Actually, that newer generation is walking with them. And at the same time that I ask myself, where is my Moses? I must also ask myself, where is my Joshua? Who am I imparting into a newer generation? Right? Who am I learning from? And who am I walking with in the sense of imparting what God is telling me? 
Discipleship, mentoring, it's all there. We didn't come up with that in modern age. They were walking together. In my life, where is my Moses? In your life, where is your Moses? We all have Moseses and Joshuas in our lives. Maybe quite, quite a few. The Moseses that, that are walking with me. People that God has placed in me and me drawing from them. The two are walking together in life, in their lives. The second thing that I want us to talk about today is whatever happened, it can't stop God. What do I mean by that? The Bible says that this guy called Moses, he was the greatest man in the Old Testament. Israel, the people, they never saw anyone like Moses. He was the guy. Even in the New Testament, when Jesus comes along, the people are still referring back to Moses, right? How do you lead after somebody like Moses has led the people? How do I come in into this? God has done something amazing in Egypt, moved with wonders. We sing of those wonders to this very day. Joshua is the new guy, this new generation. How do I fill in those shoes? How do I do that? But it's not also the good. Joshua was in the desert in this hard period and he saw what the people were like. How do I lead after this? In the desert, when God invites Moses and Joshua and there is that transition happening, God is saying, Joshua, you know the people, this is going to happen. They're going to disobey me. They're going to turn away from me. They're going to worship other idols. How do you lead after a word like that from God that is going to happen? But I am saying whatever happened, the good, the bad, and the ugly, it can't stop God. Sometimes you experience things in your life and you wonder, gosh, how am I going to be able to move on into what God has for me or for my family or for my church or for my town? How are we going to move on from that? It won't stop God. As I share this, I begin to think, gosh, how would God move in Germany after everything that happened there? It can't stop God. In our very own country. You know, we must look at these things and not limit God in what he wants to do. You know, Joshua was coming into a new thing. He saw that it was hard. He saw how hard it was to lead the people in the desert. All the complaints, everything they did, all the lies, the death that he saw in the desert. But it didn't stop him pursuing what God had for him and for the people and what they were walking into. Joshua didn't say, God is too messy, nothing can be done. Joshua was strong and courageous. Don't limit God in the good, the bad, and the ugly. God calls us for things that are right for us into a new season. And God will be with us along the way. God is not just calling us into something new and saying, off you go. God is actually going before us. In the desert, God sent an angel, the angel of his army, to go ahead of the people. And they were following him. The third thing that I can draw from Joshua is, don't go alone. Even when Moses died, so we had the period that they were walking together. Then we had the transition when Moses died and Joshua is looking, oh my gosh, how, how am I going to do this? And then we had the period after when Moses is gone and they're going to go into that land that God had promised them. Joshua chose not to go alone. One, he chose to go with God. God was the one that called him. God was the one that said, I'm going to be with you in this battle, in what is ahead of you. But not only that, do you know what Joshua did? In his book, the book of Joshua, the first chapter, he gathers the tribes and he says, this is what the Lord has said. Let's go and do it together. All the tribes walking together into that promised land. Sometimes God places things in my heart, a passion for something. Sometimes I receive a word or I'm reading the Bible and I have that sense, that impression that God is placing something in me. And I think, how can I make that happen? How can I make that happen? And when I look at the Bible, it's not about me making it happen. 
One is about God. And two, who's God placing around me for me to walk with and see the Lord glorified? Jesus was going ahead and they were following him, but they were following together. You know, I must ask myself, what has God placed in my heart? What has God placed in your heart for this time, for this season? Have you shared with people that God has placed around you? God has called us to be family. When I look at this story, and I love, I love this story. I love to look at the book of Exodus and see how God freed his people and how he purified them, how he was walking with them. But you know what? The story reminds me of another nation. The Greek for it is Kamri. Kamri and Beth. Those of you that don't speak Greek, it means Wales. You know this story, the story of the people of God leaving that, seeing, seeing something wonderful happen. It reminds me of Wales. And it's interesting, I was in, I said I was in, in Liverpool this week, and uh, we were having conversations with friends, with people in ministry, and somebody stopped the conversation, looked at me and said, are you Welsh? In my mind, I was doing this. But I said, no, I live in Wales. I believe that the story of this nation, that we can learn something from the story of another nation. God moved mightily in this nation in 1904. God did things that with human eyes and human understanding, we would not believe. God raised men and women of faith that followed God and saw amazing things happen, not only here, but in the nations. This is what God did. He did wonderful things. But today we might be saying just like Joshua or the people back then. Since then, no prophet has risen in our midst like Moses. We might be saying since then, God has not moved in that way, in that mighty way since then. We might be saying those things. No move of God has been so great in this nation. The Bible is full of stories of people walking with God in the midst of adversity, in the midst of fear and difficult times. Brokenness and courage as well. I ask myself, what is God saying to me today? Is he saying, Moses, my servant, is dead? I am with you. I begin to ask myself, can we be a little bit more like Noah, my son, who is knocking on that door and saying, let me in, and a little bit less like me who is crying in the corner and saying, my gosh, what's, what's going to happen? Is he going to handle it or not? Or can I be a little bit more brave and courageous into what is next? Adventure awaits, awaits the trust in God. Last week, we had a prophetic word about momentum. Ivan says time and again to me, we can only create the conditions. God can make it grow. It's not our job to make it happen, but we got to be ready because it will happen. God is moving in this nation. I want to read to you a report of the 1904 revival. And I'm not one of those, I'm not a person who will always refer to, to the old days. I'm not a person who's going to look back and say, oh God, do it again. I believe that God has something new, something different for us. But I want to read to you what it was like in case we have forgotten. I'm reading from the book, Carriers of Fire. It says, a great number of young people have been inspired to such an extent as to make them courageous enough to speak to sinners every chance they get. Prayer meetings are held in the trains and people are coming to Jesus. The pubs and beer clubs are empty. Old debts are paid. Jealousy vanishes. Church and family folk are healed. Great dunk drunkards, prize fighters and gamblers pray in the services and give their testimony. Chapels throughout the valleys of Glamorgan are full every night. 
all denominations have sunk their small differences to cooperate as to one body. And the huge processions along the streets send a thrill of terror through the vilest, vilest sinners. Owing to these things, the attention of the whole of South Wales is entirely captivated. The revival is the topic in all spheres and amongst all sections of society. Strong people are overwhelmed by reading the newspaper's accounts of it. People begin to pour in for all parts of the UK to see and judge for themselves of the nature and characteristics of the movement. And most of them say, this is truly the work of the Holy Spirit. And it is wonderful. This was back then. I am eager to see what God is going to do next. You see, just like the people of Israel, God did something amazing. And we must not forget. We must not forget. We must remember. But it feels like we're in that period when we are looking back at what good. And we, we are asking ourselves, God, can it be done? Can it be done again? Oh, no, this was for the past. Israel would say, oh, God moved in Egypt. He's not going to move again. How do I do that? But I believe today that we are in the Joshua generation. Those that were saved, that were born in the 1904-05 revival, they are dead. They died. And we honor them. And we thank them. We thank the Lord for what they have done through him. And we see the results of that in the nations. We see that. But I believe it's time for us to see what God is going to do in our generation. What is God going to do in Wales? What is God going to do in this nation? Because I want in. I want to be part of that. I want to build on that momentum. And I want to be fully equipped for that. And I don't want to go alone. I want to go with my Moses, and I want to go with my Joshua. I want to look at the 1904 revival, and, and I want that not to prevent me from believing that God can do something mightier in this nation. I don't want to go alone. I want to see you again. The Lord is coming. We don't often say that. It's at the back of our minds, but the Lord is coming. We must remember that. And I want to be part of that generation that looks in and says, we're going to go to the ends of the earth. And we're going to share Jesus with people so that the nations can sing it louder. Nothing has the power to save but your name. It doesn't matter how old or how young you are. You could be 120 years old like Moses. And I will still ask you, where is your Moses? You could be 10, and I'd ask you, where is your Joshua? I believe that there is momentum, that God is about to do something in our nation. The question is, are we going to get ready? Are we going to get ready? Or are we going to be discussing if there's going to be an, a next election or not? If there's going to be a deal or not? Are we going to believe that God's going to move and, it's, and that God is going to impact the world again. I want us to respond to that. I'd like to invite the, the worship group to minister to us. There's something powerful that happens when we worship. The declarations that we make. The Spirit of God moves in the worship. We believe that. I want us to worship. I want us to believe that God will move. I want us to look back and say, praise God, and look to the future and say, I'm expectant, and I want in. Shall we stand? The team is going to lead us. And let us pray as we worship. Let us declare the words as we worship. Because we can't do it. God can. Then let us ask him to come in and transform our community. Just like that report that we read, and more. In Jesus' name. Amen.